Thank you, Secretary Snavely. The, um, what he's trying to tell you about 40 years in coal and natural gas and Patel and research is I've spent my entire career wandering around the fossil energy industry space trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. And um, I think I'm getting pretty close. What I do know I don't want to be is a government official <laughs> for as long as some government officials are there. Um, I was promised by coming to this conference here that uh, I would be given one of those red pledge pins with the scissors on it. I think cutting red tape is similar to draining the swamp. And uh, so I look forward to uh, having that pledge pin and uh, being able to wear it on my lapel. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you today. Um, my responsibility is with the Fossil Energy Office. Uh, we've got about, um, about almost 1,000 uh, employees and contractors and just under a billion dollar budget. We cover coal research, oil and gas research. Uh, we have responsibility for the LNG uh, export and import terminals. And then the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, we have uh, two facilities in Louisiana and two facilities in Texas. And uh, we don't often hear about the SPRO very much, uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, but from time to time when there's a hurricane and challenges arise on getting, uh, getting crude to refineries, then we release some of that oil and uh, help uh, with any, uh, any supply constraints. On the LNG front, um, we, uh, that, it's, a, it's quite a story on the LNG front. Um, and, and let me, I tend to throw out a lot of numbers, but let me just give you some numbers to tell you what's happening in the LNG space. Right now, we have two facilities, uh, Sabine Pass, which is owned by Chenier, and then uh, Dominion Energy's Cove Point in Maryland. Those two facilities have the capacity to export about 3.5 billion cubic feet a day. Now that number may not mean too much to you if you're in the coal industry or the, the oil industry, but just keep that num number in mind, 3.5 billion cubic feet. We have four more facilities coming online and they'll be online here within the next 18 to 20 months. And that's gonna take us to 11 billion cubic feet. So we're almost tripling the amount of export of natural gas. We have, all, the Department of Energy has authorized 21 billion cubic feet. Those have not yet reached uh, their financial investment or final investment decision, but they've been approved. And then sitting over at FERC, there are another 12 facilities that will total 23 billion cubic feet a day. So if there's a market around the world, we'll have the ability to go from three and a half billion cubic feet up to 45 billion cubic feet, a factor of over 10, 15. Um, that's pretty significant. And what it's doing is it's fundamentally changing geopolitics around the world. It's giving us an opportunity to go to Europe and sell U.S. energy to our, uh, to our allies and partners in Europe who up until this moment have been almost wholly and completely dependent on Russia for their natural gas. And we have seen from time to time how that gas valve going from Russia to Europe has been used as a political tool, maybe a political weapon. And the United States has the ability to change that. It's pretty phenomenal if you stop and you think about it. We're also the largest producer of oil in the world. I spent the first three quarters of my career, and I'm looking around the room and there's people that are in my age bracket, so you'll know what I'm talking about. 
with the first oil embargo in 1973-74 and then another one in 77-78, that started a dialogue that said, we're running out of oil and gas. And it set a lot of bad policies in place. So three quarters of my career and many of yours, we're operating under this policy platform that was just fundamentally wrong. Because here we are in the last decade, we've got lots of energy, coal, oil, natural gas. We've got energy to keep us going for the next 100 years. And of course, we have renewables coming on. I saw the, the booth out there. And um, my particular area is fossil energy, but uh, there is a huge role for renewables as well. So, when you think about what the United States now has, it is just abundant energy that can and already is propelling our economy. So what was DOE's role in that? I'll tell you a little known story. Back in the 80s, the federal government spent about $140 million, which back in 1980s was not an insignificant sum of money. We spent it on two things, directional drilling and fracking. And so out of that $140 million investment of taxpayer money, your money, and a guy with a lot of vision by the name of George Mitchell <clears throat> down in Texas, that spawned a multi, uh, let's, couple hundred billion dollar business called natural gas, oil, LNG exports. For my money, that's great use of government funding. We go in, <coughs> the federal government, and do that early stage research. Industry then grabs hold of that early stage research, commercializes it, and in this particular case, is fundamentally changing how we operate here in the United States and how we operate around the world. <clears throat> Some of the other work that the Department of Energy does, in fact, <clears throat> the majority of our funding is tied into coal. I cut my teeth on coal. Uh, my first jobs were starting up coal-fired power plants. I never had the opportunity to start one in Kentucky, but I did all around Kentucky, West Virginia, and Ohio, and Tennessee. Uh, <clears throat> but. Um, we're doing a lot of research in the coal space, and I, and I want to tell you what we're doing there. One of the things we're doing is we're looking at the existing coal fleet. It was mostly built, the backbone of the fleet was built in the 1970s. I happen to know because I started up a few of them. So you can do the math, 40 plus years old. Machinery starts to get old. I mean, we all get old, right? Well, machinery does too. And so we're looking at this backbone. These units were designed and built to operate um, in a baseload capacity or baseload operation, meaning to run flat out, sort of like you put an over-the-road truck on the, uh, on the highway and it, it just goes. But what's happening is our grid is evolving because we're bringing renewables on and they're intermittent renewables. So about the time that we all leave our offices or our places of, of business and we go home and we turn on the TVs and we start cooking dinner and all those things, the sun and the wind start to abate. And so these coal-fired power plants that, were, again, were designed to run flat out have been backed down during the day and now are asked to ramp up and ramp up very quickly. And they simply weren't designed for that. So we're looking at technologies that can be installed on that existing fleet to make them operate more efficiently. And when they operate more efficiently, they operate with lower emissions. And part of that efficiency 
is to allow them to load follow in ways that they weren't initially designed for. And so that's a big part of what we do because despite what people will say, we cannot get rid of that fleet. It's 30% of the generation in the United States, much higher here in Kentucky, you can't get rid of it. And so let's make it as efficient as we possibly can. We're on the technology side, EPA is on the regulatory side, and the, Air, the Office of Air and Radiation, a guy by the name of Bill Weirm's running that office. He recently put out uh, the ACE program, which is the replacement for uh, the clean power plan. And what that ACE program is doing is number one, it's addressing a thing called NSR. How many hands, who knows NSR? New Source Review? Okay, not too many. New Source Review basically prevents existing power plants from upgrading their technology because if they upgrade their technology and they operate, even though they're operating with lower emissions per kilowatt hour, but they operate for more kilowatt hours, they're subject to new source review. And back in the 1990s, a number of power producers um, were sued for that and they entered into consent decrees which were very expensive. So it's kind of become the third rail for power producers. Well, EPA is working on that to allow these coal-fired power plants to install the technologies that we've developed at the DOE that you all paid for to make these units more nimble, meaning they can load follow, more efficient, and lower emitting. And for me, that just seems like common sense because we're not gonna shut them down, so let's upgrade them so that they operate in the evolving market that they're forced to operate in. Second area that we're focused on in, uh, at Department of Energy is the next generation of coal-fired power plants. We believe, I believe, that we've got to maintain an all of the above strategy. The President believes that. The Secretary of Energy believes that. So, what are we gonna do about that? Right now, we're not building a lot of coal-fired power plants in the United States, but we need to. But they're not gonna be the plants that we started up back in the 70s. They're not gonna be five, six, seven, eight hundred megawatt machines and two or three of them in one location because the grid's evolving. So what that means is we need to build smaller, modular, very efficient, and near zero emitting units. In terms of size, we don't know exactly what size we need to build, but we're thinking in the 50 to 350 megawatt size range, and they'll be distributed around the grid so that they can load, follow, uh, and match uh, the, um, the intermittent renewables. And so we're, we're using a lot of the technology work that we're doing on um, high temperature, high pressure uh, alloy steels, monitors, sensors, things of that nature that we're, we're developing for the existing fleet, we're gonna apply that to this next generation of coal fire plants. So we sent out a request for information uh, because we wanted to hear from industry, those people that are actually designing and building these, this next generation of coal fire power plants. And we received over 30 responses, so we're, we're culling through that right now. Uh, but it's very encouraging to me. And the next step then is we're gonna send out a, uh, a request for pre-feed studies. Um, and it is our hope that within the next several years, we can get down to the business of building some pilot plants. Uh, right now, don't have enough budget for it, but we're working on that part. But notionally, two, three, four of these plants, we think they're gonna be about 100 megawatts because that's a a, a, a size that we can uh, that we can build a pilot plant and, and probably get the funding to do so. <coughs> but the but what we're going to do and, and and this is a, a critical point is we're going to the transformational technologies. We're not going to make incremental improvements. We're going to leapfrog over what's commercially available out there right now. And most of what's commercially available, by the way, is being built by the Chinese and the Japanese and it's being fabricated in Korea or India. 
we need to be thinking about what we can build here in the United States that we can use here in the United States. And so one of the things that the Secretary has been adamant about is that we need to work together across offices, which hasn't always happened in the Department of Energy. Shocking, I know, but it's true. So we're working with the Nuclear Energy Office because one of the things that's occurring is additive manufacturing, often called 3D printing. Think about this. We can build a containment vessel using additive manufacturing, and then instead of drilling holes in it to install monitors and sensors, we embed those monitors and sensors as we're building up the vessel, as we're uh, printing it, if you will. That can be utilized in, uh, across energy sources, but in particular, nuclear energy for containment vessels and fossil energy for pressurized vessels because we're probably going to oxygen-fired pressurized combustion. And that's going to be the next transitional technology. So there's a lot of really exciting things that we're working on. <coughs> and perhaps the most exciting in these small modular plants is I think there's an export opportunity for us. Again, we've lost the race on, on coal-fired power plants. The Chinese and the Japanese are, are ahead of us on the technologies that we developed, designed and developed in the 1970s. They've taken over and they've made incremental improvements and they're doing a pretty good job of it. But that's not what our grid's gonna need in the future. We don't need those big machines, as I mentioned. <coughs> but here's where I think we can take this technology. The developing countries are also going to be in need of small modular high efficiency units because their grids are not going to develop like ours did or like Europe's did. They're going to be utilizing distributed grids, um, smart grids, and so they're going to need smaller, more modular units. And make no mistake, if they've got coal as a resource in their country, they're going to use it. So let's give them the next generation of technology so that they can operate more efficiently and more cleanly than we did when we started coal-fired generation back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So that's the second area. The third area um, is carbon capture sequestration or carbon capture utilization sequestration. <coughs> I am absolutely certain that we are going to continue to go down the path of controlling CO2 emissions. Whether we do that on a global basis and we get 10 billion people to all lock in March step, I'm not sure about that. But what I am sure is that the coal industry is going to continue to face pressure to reduce CO2 emissions. So by making more efficient units, we'll take a, a big step forward on that. But we also need to focus on CCUS. So if you look at that value chain, carbon capture utilization or sequestration, <clears throat> about 75% of the cost of CCUS is tied up in capturing the CO2. Maybe another 10% to compress it, and then the balance, the balance of 15% for the pipeline and drilling the hole, the well, uh, to store the CO2. <clears throat> so when I came to this office, we had already done a really good job about characterizing the subsurface across for lower 48 states. So what I told the Fossil Energy Office is let's focus on the really expensive piece, the 75% cost, which is capture. The folks that are really intimately involved in, in the technology development on this tell me that we can reduce the cost by 50%. Right now, we're notionally about 50 to 60%. We can get it down to 30%. We're already making progress in that area. So. What do we do then with that technology? Well, Congress passed an act called 45Q, which allows companies that capture CO2 to avail themselves of this tax credit. And if they use the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, they get $35 a ton of CO2 uh, that's sequestered in the oil field. If they store it in a deep saline formation, they get $50 a ton. <clears throat> so when you start looking at the economics of reducing capture cost 
45 Q tax credit at $35 and 70 or $80 oil, you can start to make a compelling commercial case for capturing CO2, not because it's an emission, but because it's a commodity, a useful commodity to extract more oil out of um, an existing oil field. What does that mean? That means we don't have to drill a new well because we're going to use the existing wells we have to extract more oil. In my view, and again, this is pretty straightforward logic for me, if we install numerous of these things across areas where there's, where there's oil or gas, we're going to learn by doing. And so let's get these things, let's get the cost down, let's get them installed, let's utilize that CO2 to increase production for oil and natural gas, and we will learn by doing. <clears throat> and that will propel us a lot further along in the event that we as a nation or we as a world decide that we're going to make significant reductions in CO2 emissions in the fossil energy space. Because CO2 capture doesn't just apply to coal. If we're going to make significant reductions in CO2, it will also apply to natural gas. <clears throat> Fourth area that we're focused on is getting more value out of coal. Rare earth elements is critical. You all know we use rare earth elements for cell phones and for defense um, and for medical. Most of the rare earth elements that we get come from China. And that's problematic. So let's look at what we can do with rare earth elements. And so the Fossil Energy Office is doing just that. We're looking at extracting rare earth elements from uh, coal combustion byproducts, from coal itself, from acid mine drainage. Down at uh, West Virginia University has a pilot plant, uh, a little lab scale, and they are extracting rare earth elements out of acid mine drainage. So what is a liability right now could potentially turn into an asset if we can get the cost of extracting those rare earth elements out of that acid mine drainage. And it isn't a question of whether there's significant concentrations of rare earth elements. We, we, there are. The issue now is, is reducing the cost. So we're very much focused on that. And then the final thing um, that I want to talk to you about is, is in the oil and gas space. Uh, Marty talked to you quite a bit about the impacts that unconventional oil and gas shale plays, if you will, that the impacts that those have had on, on, on our country and, and indeed the world. <coughs> but here's something that people don't generally know. In that unconventional oil and gas space, we only get about 10% out of what we call the frac zone. So we're leaving about 90% in the ground. Well, this industry is in its relative infancy. First of all, we have not yet climbed the learning curve in getting more oil and more natural gas out of these shale plays at a lower cost. We're still working our way through that and making great strides. Now, when I say we, I mean the United States. That's industries doing that, not so much the DOE. But as we've climbed this learning curve, we've amassed a large amount of data. And again, we is not the DOE, but, but producers. What we have, what the DOE has, is high performance computing capability. So what if we take that data, if producing community will give us their data, and that's problematic because they hold it pretty close to the vest. <clears throat> but we're working on them, and I think they're going to start giving us some data, and we'll protect their uh, confidentiality requirements. But if we can amass this data on subsurface geology, on horizontal drilling, on fracking, pressures, temperatures, propants, the size distribution of the propants, that's the sand that, that gets pushed down with, with the frac fluid to keep the fissures open. If we amass all of that data, we believe that on a basin by basin basis, um, and so that would be the Permian, the Marcellus, the Utica, the Bakken, those basins that are very prolific either in oil or natural gas, 
we can do a basin by basin um, data analysis using that data in our high performance computing capability. And some of the oil and gas folks that work with the fossil energy office think we could take production from 10% up to 20. Now I'm not very good in math, but I think that means we'd be doubling the production. So think about how game changing that would be if we could use data, use high performance computing capability and double production. I think what that would ensure is that our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren will have abundant energy for decades and decades and decades to come. Whether we use it or not, that's up to technology development and policy. But at least we have it to use if we need it. And my final comment is the Department of Energy does a lot of work with the University of Kentucky. And I can tell you that they are a great partner. This work has been going on for decades now. Um, I saw a couple booths out there. Um, they do a lot of really good work across the spectrum of what we're interested in doing, whether it's rare earth elements um, <coughs> or emissions control. Um, Kentucky and the DOE have been solid partners for years to come. And then the f I said the final thing, I lied to you. I got one more thing I want to talk about, and that's your governor. <clears throat> I had the privilege of spending some time with him at the Southern States Energy Board last month. And um, it was a real honor. It, it, it's a rare opportunity to be able to sit down at a table and just talk. And the governor, your governor, gave me that opportunity to sit and talk and tell him what's important to the Fossil Energy Office, what's important to the Department of Energy. I didn't have to tell him what's important to President Trump because he has dialogue going with him already. <coughs> but this guy up here at this podium is a big fan of your governor. And um, I am honored and privileged to be here today with you. And uh, thank you for your attention. First, I'm going to say, because I know we have a lot of staff here, that uh, at, at one point I didn't think I wanted to do, uh, work in government either, but I actually kind of enjoy it. It's been a great thrill to work with all of you. Um, and to comment on something Steve said, I'm a, little, I'm a little, you know, I'm from the eastern Kentucky coal industry, and I know what effect natural gas prices and production have done thus far. If we double natural gas production and the price goes down, more, I don't think you have to worry much about those modular coal plants. <laughs> but there has been effect to that, you know, that there's good, um, the uh, increase in production of oil and natural gas in the country has had a, a huge positive effect on the country. It's also had some adverse effect uh, even in Kentucky. And that's what brings us to the next topic because our own uh, Bob Scott, the d director of the Division of Abandoned Mine Lands and his group have been, um, we, we've all been kind of stretched out of our comfort zone because we've sort of gotten into the economic development business. And uh, because of the downturn in the coal industry, it's, it's created a lot of unemployment. Uh, I was one of those. And, um, and so we're, we have, a, I think, a very powerful uh, effort to try to improve the economy in the eastern part of the state, and that's the topic of the next panel uh, about the abandoned mine lands pilot program. So, Bob Scott.
while these guys are getting set up, uh, Mr. Winberg, I do appreciate your comments. And uh, I'll, I will let you know that Pete, uh, Pete Goodman with our Division of Water is in the building. And uh, Pete, when he was talking about draining the swamp, he was talking not about a wetland. So call off those enforcement folks. Uh, we're, he, he's okay there. But uh, as Secretary said, I am Bob Scott. I'm director of the Division of Abandoned Mine Lands. Your words on the coal, uh, the coal, uh, there's a fee on coal that pays our AML fee. So it, it's good to know that uh, and coal is going to be a, a steady force in our energy sector for, for time to come. Joining me on stage today are Justin Adams, uh, also with Kentucky AML, Tim Gibbs with Ashland Alliance, and Daniel Elliott, president and CEO of Interblue. I'll tell you a little bit more about these guys later as they come and explain to you their role with the AML pilot program. This AML pilot program took off in 2016 as Congressman Rogers was trying to find a way to boost that give that economic boost in the Appalachian area. And uh, so he, he set aside, uh, I guess, uh, some funding for this program. And our division, I guess, was called on to administer it because we've had a, a presence in Appalachia for quite some time. And we've been good stewards of that AML fee that's generated from the coal, coal production. And so I began my career uh, in 1983 with AML. And in that period of time, I've seen a whole lot of good AML reclamation projects completed. Uh, one of those today we'll honor at lunch is the Roger Cornett landslide. There was a devastating landslide in Perry County, and our crew put together plans, had contractors come in to stabilize that landslide just to safeguard the, the people, safeguard public. But over the course of the last few years, we've reached out into another area that focuses on economic development in conjunction with our regular AML projects. We're taking on this task of putting AML pilot dollars into the, uh, the world of economic development. Uh, our own Lanny Brannick and John Muir have developed a, a video that talks a little, more, a little bit more about this pilot program. So I'll ask you guys to roll that video if you can. I had the idea, and we put it into a bill called Reclaim, uh, to uh, bring more of that money out of the Abandoned Mine Lands Fund for projects not just to reclaim land, but to reclaim land for commercial uh, use. So in 016, I just earmarked in the funding bill for the federal government uh, for 016, uh, some $25 million out of the general treasury as a pilot project to demonstrate this idea of uh, reclaiming land for the purpose of uh, of creating jobs. Several thousand jobs have been lost over the past 10 years and we have an exceptionally skilled workforce. It wasn't just the miners that were affected, it was engineering and surveying, and accountants, uh, restaurants, any number of things that experienced that decline. This building happened to be vacant um, and available. Um, it was originally intended to be a pharmacy school um, and has sat vacant for five or six years. And so we did a little bit of renovating here um, and AML um, stepped in. We were um, fortunate enough to get a grant um, from AML and we renovated. We decided to um, set up shop here in East Kentucky um, to retrain the thousands of um, uh, mining personnel that we have here. And so we opened, um, we started our first class here in Paintsville in November. Uh, our mine shut down. Yeah, they, up in Mark County, shut the whole operation down and got laid off. And unemployment got into this this class here was training, and I really like it. Most everybody in the region has been impacted, and we have seen 
Um, a lot of people leave the area um, in, in search of work. I mean, people have to feed their families. Now there are manufacturing companies, um, heavy industry companies that are interested in Eastern Kentucky purely because we have the workforce available. And so that, that is turning into a great asset. This project, we're gonna open in 2020. In less than five years, we will host on site over 850,000 paid attendees. When you bring 850,000 people to one spot, that will have a one year, $167 million economic impact. We're gonna have 168 employees on site, but when you get eight and 900,000 visitors to one spot, sustain that for five years, that economic impact, you do the multipliers, it creates over 2,800 jobs in the region. We're gonna build an economic force based on wildlife conservation, wildlife restoration, wildlife recreation, and education, right in the heart of coal country. When the pilot project money came up, it was that huge, huge financial shot in the arm, that first big chunk of the capital campaign, $12.5 million is what we got, got awarded. It was the, it's what launched it. So we are focused on projects that create jobs, number one. We're fo we are focused on projects that create economic activity. So we have approved projects that are tourism based. We've approved projects that are education based and we have approved projects that are manufacturing. Well, the abandoned mine lands uh, grant projects were announced uh, and the city is always very progressive and looking for opportunities to make our projects move forward. And it, we saw that as, a, as an excellent opportunity to uh, fund a project at our industrial park where the city had invested tens of millions of dollars to get this park ready for development. But the one key factor that we were missing was a building that we could use to attract tenants. The park has progressed much quicker than we thought. We anticipated that it would take five to 10 years to fill our park. Uh, but within uh, just a few months of receiving the grant and beginning the design process for our speculative building, we had identified a tenant and began working through the terms of that deal with him. Uh, and uh, the building will be sold upon substantial completion and we expect operations to commence there almost immediately. You know, this is a, a large turning point for our community. It signals uh, development of new industries, which we really haven't had that much in the past, especially manufacturing. And we hope that their success in Pikeville will attract other companies that are also interested in manufacturing or uh, whatever the case may be to, to locate here. It has the effect of causing localities to be thinking about what can we do to improve the economy in our community, our county. Uh, and there's money available now through these pilot projects to let them experiment, if you will, and develop their ideas uh, to create better jobs and a better way of life in, in East Kentucky. North to South, we have incredible opportunities before us. I'm grateful to Congressman Rogers, to the AML program itself, and I would have the people of Kentucky know we are being good stewards of these monies, and we are making sure that they are being spent where we will get a great return on our investment. As you saw in the video, we are completing projects that focus on economic development. I appreciate Governor Bevin's interest in the AML program and his continued support for the hardworking folks throughout our state. Secretary Snavely and Commissioner John Small have been involved in this program. They've helped us uh, and gone through every application that we received, over 100 applications for the first two rounds. And I appreciate their, their hard work and support. 
They, uh, of course, are, are from coal country. Their leadership and their knowledge of, of coal country has helped us uh, get the best projects out there. Secretary Snavely's also reached out to other cabinets, tourism, the folks in tourism and the folks in economic development to make sure we've got the top-notch projects. With the first round of AML projects, we selected nine, nine projects and uh, $30 million. And some of those that you saw, they're already underway, making a difference to the economy there in their areas. The second round, we've got 10 projects for $25 million. And, and those projects are gonna create jobs, they're gonna bolster tourism, they're, they're gonna call upon that, that hardworking coal miner that's going through a career change. And so, uh, like I say, a Appalachia, you folks that have been down there, you know it's one of the most scenic areas in the United States. It's got flowing streams, gentle mountains, uh, beautiful green valleys. But the one thing that it does have, it has, has a dedicated, hardworking labor force. These guys, I, I say they're educated and they're dedicated, and that goes good with the folks that we're trying to attract. Uh, at the SOAR conference in Pikeville, Congressman Rogers and Governor Bevins announced a third round of AML project, for another $25 million. This is gonna bring $80 million uh, through this AML pilot program to infuse and try and boost the economy. The application period for this third round is uh, until November 16th. So right now I'd like to introduce our first guest, Justin Adams. He's an environmental scientist consultant with AML. He's got over 22 years with state government, six, or over 13 of those with, uh, with AML. He, uh, I've taken, asked him to take on the lead of this pilot program as it's grown and grown and it's much more greater demand now in, in our third year. He also happens to be our lead pilot for our UAV drone program. Diff different word of the pilot, but uh, say he's, he's a top-notch guy. He's got a chemistry degree from the University of Pikeville and has been a lifelong resident of East Kentucky. Justin Adams. Thank you. Um, thanks, Bob, for that introduction. Uh, it'll be difficult for me to stand up here and talk to you in a single location. I usually wander around when I'm talking, but there's something sort of relaxing about being the least most important person on the stage throughout two days of events, so uh, have a little fun with me, I guess. Um, one of the things I'd like to say, not only just thanks to uh, Director Scott for the opportunity to speak here today, but also the opportunity to work throughout the coal fields and to Secretary Snavely and Commissioner Small for those opportunities, but I can't really believe that Bob would have invited me to come up here and talk, uh, knowing my propensity to be rather windy. Um, and so uh, I apologize on his behalf for taking up the rest of your day. I'm not sure when lunch is, but we'll break for it at some point. Um, I guess I've got a little presentation there we'll go over and talk about. I hate that I showed Bob this presentation before, uh, this because he wrote down, I guess, like half of what I was gonna say in his introductory remarks. Uh, but when, uh, when we talked about Coming up here and presenting about this, uh, Bob said, you know, hey, talk about the pilot program. Well, hey, wait a minute, talk about water lines. Well, it turns out really what we were talking about was AML and economic development in uh, the coal fields regions. So let me see if I can get this thing to work. That way, maybe. Is there a button? Yeah, that's what I was trying. Two, two, yeah. Both, neither. Hey, all right, so just let me talk some, right? I got that one. I like it. I got my technical guy up there. Yeah. Lanny, I'll give you $5 if you bug him after this as well. <laughs> Any idea, gentlemen? Okay. So did you guys hear about the, uh, no. <laughs> you hear about the uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex? Opened up a uh, cafe downtown. Food's really good, but the service is kind of slow. They're short-handed. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They, uh, my bad. They were going to expand to the moon, but they heard the atmosphere wouldn't be good up there. Just, I'll stop. My bad. Those are my only two, actually. Ah, that's me. I don't know how to get stories. 
Ja, får se. Jag ser igen. Did you say I had 15 minutes? Uh, 14 minutes now? I'm glad somebody's timing. Thank you. Thank you. I used to work for the Cabinet for uh, Family Health, Cabinet for Health and Family Services, uh, Department of Community-Based Services, Social Services. Um, I can remember distinctly uh, after working there for a while in quality services, uh, one day my uncle who worked for the Department of Mine Reclamation Enforcement called me up. He said, um, he said, look, there's an inspector's position open in the Prestonsburg AML office. And I said, what's an AML? Uh, and he said, it's only the best agency in state government. Um, and I found out that was true. So I worked for, uh, was fortunate enough to be hired at, at the Prestonsburg office and worked there for, I don't know, 10 years it felt like before uh, Bob afforded me the opportunity to move into a couple of different positions. And I've had a real pleasure driving around the state and looking at all the stuff that we do and what we've been involved in. Um, I don't know that I've made any difference or impact, but I sure had a good time taking a look at it um, and trying to assess what we do and, and how we do. The amazing thing is about AML is that we have so much involvement into the communities that we work with. You know, we're talking about economic development. Oh, hey, are we good? Yay, all right. Let's see. Ah, that's good. So let me talk to you about, before we talk about AML and AML's work, we have to talk about history, right? So I'm not a geologist or an archaeologist or a theologist, but at some point, right about there, uh, in the Carboniferous period, about 60 million years between the Devonian and the Permian, about 300 million years ago, tetrapods ruled the planet, amphibians everywhere. Um, New plants developed in the, the environment, which was oxygen rich. Super huge trees and ferns that wouldn't grow in today's environment because of the atmosphere. When they fell and died, there really wasn't a lot of bacteria to break them down, and so they formed these peat moss beds, which eventually got compressed into coal. And then right there, Jimmy Carter signed SMACRA. And so that's all we're going to do, talk about geology. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I was talking about AML in my time working there. Um, and, you know, if you're going to talk about what we do and, and how we do things. Uh, basically, what AML does is try to abate hazards that are related to historic mining across the coal field regions. We're 100% federally funded. That trust fund comes from a tonnage extracted fee. The division of the funds is based on formula that considers historic coal production. Of course, in our state, as you may well know, we have two very distinct coal beds. Uh, in the blue there, the Appalachian Basin, and then in the yellow, of course, the Illinois Basin. Uh, historically, coal production has occurred in about 50 counties in Kentucky, but many others have seen impact due to transportation and processing. We've got a series of offices. We have three regional offices, Madisonville, London, and Prestonsburg. We have an emergency branch response office in Hazard, Kentucky, and of course, our central office in Frankfurt. Employees in the division are tasked with a variety of different jobs, uh, and sometimes people don't realize that. We don't just go out and do reclamation work on hazard sites. We do inspections, citizen complaints, eligibility determinations, reclamation projects, designing and bidding, inspection of hazard abatements. We have a rapid response for emergencies. We've also got an AMD program, uh, bond forfeiture assessment and reclamation, a waterline program, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, and then, of course, we've been heavily involved in the Abandoned Mine Land Reclamation Economic Development Pilot Program, or more commonly referred to as the AML Pilot Program. Um, those last two, the AML Pilot and the Waterline, we're going to talk about. But if, if I'm going to talk to you about AML and the role in economic development, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you about those, those first three uh, bubbles there, that Reclamation, Emergency Response, and Bond Forfeiture Program. Um, and the reason why is if you take a look at these these photos here, these are all from active AML sites uh, across the region over the last few years. Um, they've all got kind of one thing in common. It's not that they're dirt. Um, it's not so much that there's work there, but there are people working on those sites, men and women employed uh, on AML-related uh, economic sites. And one of the sites that Bob mentioned earlier and that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later today, hopefully, is the Roger Cornett site in Perry County. Uh, these photos are from AML work on a slide in Leatherwood, Kentucky. The conditions on that site were extremely hazardous. Um, 
Suffice it to say that after development of a project design, a small family-owned reclamation company from Manchester won that bid. Over the span of several months, that company, a Triple H, executed reclamation efforts on the site. And the final result was a dangerous situation, well resolved, uh, and a sense of resolution and safety for those citizens. In terms of economic impact, con small contractors like Triple H and numerous others thrive because of the influx of AML projects in coal fields. Each year, AML designs millions of dollars in projects that are bid throughout those coal counties. Those projects employed contractors, equipment operators, truck drivers, general laborers. Of course, they also buy supplies that are like rock and basket stone. I can tell you my father-in-law used to be a little Debbie uh, distributor of cakes, and it makes a difference if guys are stopping and working and buying cakes. When the coal industry took a downturn, my father-in-law, David, was always the first guy to know because he sold less fudge rounds. Just, just the truth. Um, AML has been making an economic impact in Appalachia since its beginning, uh, keeping small family-owned construction businesses like Triple H uh, usually as busy as they can stand. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah we're good. All right. Good deal. So if we're taking a look at those, uh, those particular bubbles when we talk about the waterline program, Aside from uh, contract and reclamation, AML's impact in the uh, socioeconomic structure of the region can be found in programs like our waterline program. But before we talk about waterline program, we have to kind of talk about acid mine drainage. Um, it's important to talk about the serious impact AMD has on the environmental surroundings. Here you can see a couple of examples of that. Um, primarily the projects that we uh, conduct that are related to acid mine drainage um, address the impacts of the old mine works on streams and bodies of water. This is one of um, Director Scott's favorite examples to talk about. It's Lower Rock Creek, uh, the reclamation generally achieved through this passive treatment. Um, particularly in Lower Rock Creek and McCreary County, uh, eight miles of stream was reclaimed. Uh, those projects are challenging and rewarding, but typically they address the obvious environmental impacts, ones that you can see. Um, there are less obvious impacts of uh, historic mining, uh, particularly where groundwater is concerned. Things like elevated dissolved solids, sulfate, iron contamination, trace metals, the quality of the water. There are some uh, serious effects on citizens living in those regions. Since the earliest days of development in rural Kentucky, uh, well water has been a source of life for families. Even as our society is modernized, many coal field families depend on their well. Uh, those wells often tap into the water rich aquifers that coal seams are. So they deal with these issues and that has a direct impact on things like what they drink or how they're bathing, what they're washing. That's harmful to their health, but it's also impactful to their quality of life. Now, generally, the most uh, obvious sign of that is iron flock or flocculent disdain. Impacts, of course, uh, vanities, toilets. Oh, those are kind of quick advance there, but sinks, pans, uh, also um, appliances, uh, even particularly sometimes uh, ba bathing areas. You can see there, uh, they've, uh, I guess, asked the Avengers to come help, and Iron Man couldn't really do much about the iron stain. No, I'm not sure if he was using repulsor rays on that or not. But. And then this is, if you're familiar with uh, typical iron treatment, uh, especially for rural regions, so this is a salt filter, an example of one. Uh, typically requires rock salt, and they're almost uh, invariably in a crawl space, which is unfortunate. There it is. Oh, now let me go back if I can. Yay. So AML replaces uh, water lines through a, a program that we have. That water line program is um, an effort to mitigate historic hazards with the goal of providing citizens of the Commonwealth with access to clean and safe drinking water. Uh, the division determines whether eligible agency eligible pre-1982 mining has negatively impacted groundwater in Kentucky's rural coal fields. Most of that comes with a request for help, which we follow up then with uh, significant research. That all begins with GIS, looking at topo maps, 
or mine scene maps or even historic mining maps. And then uh, the dedicated men and women of our staff, like Ernie, who's here today, I believe. Hey, Ernie, work hard at conducting field studies. Those exhaustive water quality studies um, include sampling available water sources in the community uh, from residences and businesses, and those waters are tested then for contamination. I'm trying. Yeah. Oh, wait. If it's determined that 50% or more of those uh, households uh, are, have a link to pre-law mining in the area, then it's eligible for AML funding. Um, all dwellings at that time of water line construction have an opportunity for a water meter base uh, at no cost unless it's refused in writing. You can see here in that sample study, um, it's a in that particular watershed, there's a lot of sampling that has occurred there to determine whether or not there's eligibility. The process that AML engages in with community partners involves an MOA, a Memorandum of Agreement, of course, all the federal NEPA requirements. Um, suffice it to say that we act with a lot of community partners in these areas. And then that ends up being a opportunity for us to advertise. Oh, let me see if I can get back. And we end up putting in a water lo lot of water lines. We do so utilizing digging and drilling, building structures like this water tower, installing important electronics. And this is the part I'm going to talk about a little bit, my own personal experience. Instead of uh, telling you about some numbers of people impacted or lines installed or something of that nature, I I'm from a little community called Pine Top. It, does anybody know where Pine Top is? Hey, that's that's uh, now not my friends. That doesn't count. But but so Pine Top's a collection of homes beside of a state route, like a lot of communities in eastern Kentucky. Um, I've lived there or in and around that community my entire life, uh, and we had a well water source. It's the same source that my grandfather used and his father used. Uh, it's a fourth generation farm, uh, and it's stuck right in the middle of a coal seam, about 70 feet down. We have a lot of sulfur in that water there out of the well. I, mean, I didn't know that, you know, you just drink it, smells odd, whatever, washing it, bathing it, that's fine. Um, but then later, uh, when I went to college, of course, I discovered that, that that actually wasn't. City water is pretty nice, you know. Uh, and then came back home, and my, my wife and I, we ended up building a home not far from where, where I grew up at. We put a well in the ground because we didn't have any utilities, and we made tons of iron, of course, in that water, uh, even though it wasn't less than a quarter of a mile away. And uh, I had a salt filter in a crawl space, a 40-pound bag suck and three foot of cover. It's a bad deal to have to do that. Uh, about four years ago, we were really blessed in my little community that AML found us eligible and helped our county expand water lines. I'm telling you, you don't know it, but there's nothing like chlorine in the morning sometimes. You know, that's, that's okay. It's all right. Um, and so that's my personal impact. I, I'm actually very thankful for that personally. But, but I'll tell you, the, the truth here is, is that the real impact is in this story. So about 28 years ago, look at that, isn't she beautiful? About 28 years ago, I met this little girl and uh, asked her out. She lived in a little place called Emelina, also in Knott County. And uh, for some reason, she stuck around with me and we had a bunch of kids. But I was always struck by her sienna hair. I mean, it's just kind of an odd color, sort of unusual, a little red. I kind of like that, you know. It turns out after I got her away, from the well water at her house, she's just got auburn hair. She's just a brunette. I was so disappointed. I thought, what? False advertisement. It really is. So it's di direct impact right there. So those are our beautiful children there, too. I had to put them up on the screen. Uh, I guess I did include a slide about the numbers. It's my bad. I'm sorry. Uh, so 24 counties impacted historically, hundreds of miles of water line, $150 million invested. Uh, 16,500 households, probably more than that at this point, uh, with significant ongoing impacts. We know we've got a bunch of active projects right now, too. I won't go into details on these, but you can see them as they come up here. They involve a, a, an installation of water lines, water meters, storage tanks, booster tanks, um, all across the uh, state, really. 
but particularly in rural Appalachia. Uh, and then three here at the bottom, Roxana, um, Water Systems Control for Martin, and South Fork of Elkview, those are related to pilot projects. You can see there are seven counties, 11 projects. That's from 2018, $3.9 million bid, 2.9 spent, and a projection of 11 million before all these projects are finished. So if we're talking about water lines, we're talking about economic development, we'd be remiss not to talk about the pilot grant. Um, of course, Bob just discussed, Director Scott just discussed, uh, you'll have to forgive me for being informal with you, Director Scott, uh, just discussed um, this program and uh, its impact on the region uh, with strong support from the governor and with a great measure of success, the ideas of the pilot grant really kind of struck a chord within the communities there. I feel blessed to uh, be able to sit down uh, at tables with folks and talk about their ideas and uh, their goals or objectives for the future and to see them come to fruition. Um, it turns out that when you talk to these folks, it's a lot of the same people we talk to when we talk about water lines or when we talk about um, impacts to communities. So whether or not someone's calling us for uh, help with a slide in their backyard or in a constituent's backyard or about water line or about their ideas about pilot, it's quite a bit of money. It's the same people, the same teams of people, the same leadership. Um, and so it is kind of familiar for us as an agency to deal with these folks. Um, we provide some expertise in reclaiming hazard abatement and then they provide expertise in what's good for their community and what they need and what they're looking forward to. The interesting thing about those pilot grants is that if you look at how many of them have a water line component, it's pretty impressive. As you can see there from 2016, 67% of the winning applicants had a water line component and 2017, 60% because infrastructure is so important in these regions. And take a look at those three in green that we talked about there earlier, the South Fork Elk View water line uh, campground. So that's the construction of campground installation water line to an existing elk viewing development and a potential ATV trailhead, uh, efforts to spur future development of cabins and other adventure tourism. Uh, also there's the Roxana water line. Um, and we're doing, there's a couple of projects as part of that grant. Uh, but particularly the installation of 50,000 linear feet of transmission water line and elevated storage tanks and booster pumps associated with it. And then, of course, if you're from Kentucky, you know about the difficulties for the Martin water system. And uh, this grant in particular will look at raw water intake modifications, transmission line extensions, installation of system-wide telemetry, um, piping and pump upgrades. Uh, this grant represents a great opportunity like the others to resolve issues or concerns and to spur growth. Of course, you can't have economic growth without good infrastructure. And uh, so that in that respect, these pilot grants go hand in hand with what AML is familiar with doing. Here's some, just some other examples of some of the other pilots. And these, these pilots all have water line components too. They have utility needs, the sites have utility needs. And this gentleman here, I'm sure we'll talk about the, the future that they have envisioned and how great these projects are. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them, but Bob probably won't let me answer, so. Uh, that's good then, all right. Sorry if I took more than my amount of time. Thank you. I think I got everything. Thank you, Justin. I know there's uh, fellow directors here in the in the audience, and you guys may be thinking, "Hey, I'd like to steal that, Justin Adam." Well, stop thinking that. That's that's stealing. That, that's against the Ten Commandments. Uh, Courtney Skaggs, the DMRE, she stole so many of my folks. Uh, she's got to go to confession Friday night. She's got, <laughs> but uh, our next speaker will be uh, Tim Gibbs. He's president and CEO of Ashland Alliance. The Alliance is a 126-year-old chamber of commerce. Chamber of Commerce Agency in Northeast Kentucky. Tim has also served as economic and development prof professional in Aberdeen, Washington, as CEO of Greater Grays Harbor Incorporated, and served as president and CEO of a, a county economic development in Northwest Colorado. Tim holds a master's degree from Eastern Kentucky University in public administration, as well as an undergraduate degree in political science from Moorhead State University. He is a board member of the Kentucky Association of Economic Development and has also served as county judge executive in Round County here in Kentucky. Please welcome Tim Gibbs.
Good morning. Well, I'm not going to be near as funny as that. I can tell you right up front, okay? It, it's really special being in front of you today. Um, this AML pilot grant has the ability to change Kentucky and really change Appalachia. Um, we're going to go through, in particular, how this is leveraging a project in Northeast Kentucky and what the impacts of that project is going to be in Northeast Kentucky. But before I get started, nothing we do is a silo. We have to have partners, whether it's the state of Kentucky, whether it's Secretary Snavely, or it's the AML, or it's our county. I have with me uh, my county judge executive from Greenup County, uh, Bobby Carpenter. Bobby's been the economic development governor for Northeast Kentucky, or governor, he likes that, don't you? <laughs> county judge for going on 25 years now. We also have Nikki Smith, she's the economic development uh, professional for Boyd County, and she's worked through six county judges, one county judge twice even. She also chairs uh, the Northeast Kentucky Industrial Development Authority, which I'm a board member of, and she is also on the Greenup County, Boyd County, River uh, Riverport uh, Development Board. And we have Amanda Clark as well, who's my vice president of the Ashton Alliance. Um, without these people, these projects simply don't work. And so I'm very, very happy they joined me today. Economic development is an incredibly, incredibly competitive endeavor. Every single day, there's 2,000 communities, you know, nationwide that are trying to do exactly the same thing you do. If you're not constantly trying to improve your community, define your product, mitigate issues that you have, you're simply left behind and you cannot compete. And it is truly a competition. The, the project that I'm going to be speaking of, four states were in the running. There was literally hundreds of communities that was under consideration. Ultimately, 24 were the finalists, of the, 20, of the 24, we were the last community standing and we won the project. But you have to do the work. You've heard people talk extensively already today about the workforce of Eastern Kentucky. Well, we wanted to take that and define it. We wanted to quantify it. We wanted only not only quantify the skills they have, what they know, how they learned it, how it can be applied, what other, what other sectors it gives us a competitive advantage in, and also the qualitative side, which I don't think a lot of people had ever thought of. There are communities in this, in this state that are near full employment now, where people may walk across the street for a quarter more on the hour because they know they can because jobs are that plentiful and there's that much demand. But what we found out was a coal miner was not someone with a pick and a shovel. They were someone that was doing middle level STEM employee and middle level STEM work every single day. They were working with pneumatics. They were working with DC power. They, they understood heavy machinery. They were working shift work. They understood soft skills because they were working as a team, many times even underneath the ground, and where they had to work collectively and together for their safety and for the production of the product. This also goes also for the steel workers of Northeast Kentucky as well. They weren't just making steel. They were making alloys. They were making 47 different types of steel and alloys at the AK Steel facility at the blast furnace in Boyd and Greenup counties. So when we profiled those jobs, when we did a regional workforce study, when we worked together, when we spent a half million dollars of mostly public or private dollars, we were able to define a competitive advantage in a workforce that did not exist other places. We were able to break down the idea that we're not just a commodity. We're not the same as people up the road or down the road from us. We were able to build that, brand that, market that, and move forward. We were the first build-ready site in Eastern Kentucky. We were the first McCallum and Sweeney AEP quality certified site in Eastern Kentucky and only the third certified site to that level in the entire state. We've done aerospace certifications because we found out that aerospace is the largest export in the state of Kentucky. Well, guess what? One of the biggest transferable skill sets that we had in our people was metal fabrication. We had eight times the number of metal fab workers in Northeast Kentucky in particular than the state or the national average. The number one job in aerospace is metal fabrication. You find what you're good at. You build it, you build a brand, you build a marketing around that. Brady Industries, you, you hear about it, you read about it. This literally is the, the ability to change not just our economy in Northeast Kentucky, 
but that of Appalachia. This 1.8 million square feet facility will be the 13th largest building in the United States under one single roof. It says 200 acres, that's what they acquired from the industrial park. They've actually acquired more than that. It's about 240 acres, about 100 acres under roof. Um, dirt's moving, you know, doing retention ponds, you know, doing the things they need to do, getting ready for construction out there. They've also acquired two additional buildings, and there's already been the announcement of one spinoff company. And you heard about the 3D printing you know, earlier today by our first speaker. This company specializes MIT spinoff on, on nanocrystal metals 3D printing. It's exactly what they do, which is going to change the world. Imagine if you can make any metal product 80% stronger at the same weight. Most metals get a little better, a couple percent a year in, in, uh, in strength versus weight. Imagine flipping that and going up to 70, up to 80% stronger with the same consistency and weight, and it can be 3D printed. What if you're on an aircraft carrier and you have to carry parts for all the planes? Well, why not just carry the CAD files and be able to print them? If you're in a, if you are being deployed uh, and you need access uh, to parts on the battlefield and you can just print what you need rather than have the supply lines to, supl to supply it. Northeast Kentucky has got something special going on. We realize what our fortes is, and while the governor stood here yesterday and talked about engineering and manufacturing, ours is advanced manufacturing. Ours is looking at things like carbon fiber and graphene and nanocrystal metals and what you can do with metals and batteries to change the world through the advantages that we represent in this region. Now, the AML and where it's so important is we know there's unique challenges and opportunities when you're on abandoned mine uh, lands. Where we are, which is located between I-64 and US-23, so north, south, east, west, there is an industrial highway that, that has the fingerprints of Judge Carpenter all over it. I think he's been responsible for probably more deer on the road than any other place in Kentucky when they built this highway, but um, there's 18,000 acres of strip mine land out there. Now the park is a thousand acre regional park on that, on the corner of I-64, but there's 18,000 acres out there. And there's challenges when you're building on reclaimed land. Um, so we, this is just a layout and I'm not gonna dive into this because I got a few better slides that will get into the weeds a little bit more than this. But on our site, the overburden or the spoils down to a shell and down to a rock level is between 40 and 46 feet. That's good and it's a challenge. It's good because it's very consistent from one end to the other you know, of, of the site. It's also a challenge because you gotta do things to that before you can build upon it, especially when you're building something that can have machinery up to 200 tons, large, large machinery, and it can't settle. It's gotta be perfect. So, and it's gotta be perfect now, and it's gotta be perfect 35 years from now. So what the, our grant is, it's a $4 million grant for a uh, $18 million project. And what they're going to do is they're going to have uh, machines that are GPS controlled that's gonna do on a 10 by 10 grid aggregate piers down to the rock, 40 to 46 feet. These things, they don't drill, they hydraulically press into the ground, they compact the ground out, squeeze the ground out, and they drop aggregate rock and compact it up to the surface. Now some of these will be mixed with dry concrete as well, some will just be the, just the rock, but it's on a perfect 10 by 10 GPS controlled environment that's going to have 18,000 piers. So it's gonna be anchored to rock. It's gonna be setting on rock and it will control uh, uh, the settling of this. And then there's gonna be an, uh, an overview or over cap as well. Now, it's expensive. Now, no matter where you built this, if you pick the perfect Greensfield spot anywhere, there's going to be expense to build a building this size. There's no doubt about that. So there are expenses, but when you're dealing once again with these type lands, there are additional expenses. Now, you heard me earlier say, that economic development is incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, competitive. We have to be competitive. We have to be able to overcome or bring partners and things to the table for we can have this type of development in regions that desperately have it, in places where they can be successful and they can change your economy. So 
This is, you can see the breakdown of what it costs, but it's an $18,200,000 uh, um, project, and we're bringing $4 million to the table to help with this. I'm approaching the end of my presentation, but there's a few things, and I'm not trying to be coy about this, but I just want you to understand the impact that we're talking about. And the reason this is so powerful and what it's going to do, this is going to change our future for the next 100 years. And not, not just ex, our future, but from here to Pikeville. And it, you're going to see it and you're going to feel it. People are going to have the opp opportunities to stay in their homes. They're going to have the opportunity to be raised around their grandparents. They're going to have opportunities they never had before. When we throw numbers out what, like $1.8 billion dollars, we're not used in our head visualizing what that is. So I thought I would give you a little visual aid. $1.8 billion. The project's 30 months long. It's gonna take 30 months to build, the, uh, build it and we're just getting started. 30 months is 912 days, okay? 912 days to, to put this behemoth in the ground to change our future. Each one of you, your communities you come from, whether it's your large or small, if you could announce daily or weekly or in a month that you had a project that's coming to town that's going to bring 1.973684 and 12 cents on the side, it would be significant, $1.9 million. Imagine announcing that every day, every week, every month for 30 months. That's the perspective of where we are right now. Now, Mark Twain says there's always facts, lies, and statistics, and I, and I think he's right about that. You know, there's $500 million in equipment going in this facility. But I, I haven't used the word or the words of uh, multipliers. I haven't used the, the, the spinoffs. I haven't talked about the fact that since January 1st of this year, we've hosted 21 companies that either want to supply upstream or downstream of this project that this project alone, this is 650 jobs. The Veloxet spinoff's 150 jobs. So that's 800 jobs right there. But it's the anchor. It's, it's the beginning. We're double, triple, quadruple. We had a thousand acre park that two years ago, I don't wanna say it was lonely, but it didn't, it wasn't, it, it hadn't met its goals and objectives yet. Now we're talking expansion. Now we're talking scarcity. Now we're talking about what is next, about what's around us and what's in the region. One of the core components of what we're doing now is trying to identify our sites and get them up and get them marketed. So many cool things going on here. And the AML has been our partner and has brought things to the table to allow us to compete. We've done the work. And we're not done and we're never going to be done. We're going to keep competing and keep doing more certifications and building more partnerships. Amy Elliott, Kentucky Power. The leadership that Kentucky Power has brought to the table in economic development in Eastern Kentucky cannot be overestimated. They understood that they couldn't cut themselves to prosperity. They have baseline expenses with generation, with transmission. They needed growth. Well, how do you, how do you inspire growth? You partner in economic development. You help us be hyper-competitive. You help us overcome our deficiencies. That's what this AML program, pilot program, has done as well. We are a big tent, and many times we have, the, we have the baton, and we hope that people sometimes will try to follow, follow the lead that we're trying to set. I'm going to end by showing you a video that represents what this plant's going to look like and what AML and the $4 million that was brought to the table under this pilot program has has and able to happen in a region that many people didn't think could be successful. And now I'm truly to the point that I can almost say, why wouldn't you come here? Where else could you go? Where, who else can compete with what we have to offer for long-term success, for availability, for quality of life, for transportation, for logistics, for cost of doing business, where else are you going to go to have those type things? That's a far cry different than we were two years ago, five years ago, or 25 years ago. So let's watch a video.
There's some glorious music that's not playing in the background, by the way. Yeah. I went to Fleetwood Mac the other night, but I'm not going to try it. Once again, it's showing the, uh, uh, the 10 foot piers here. Did we freeze up? This building's going to be nearly one mile long. Look at the scale with the earth movers. This didn't come overnight. Lots of hard work. A lot of it happened. I, I used to say BT before Tim. But 100 people did 1,000 things. One of the core components of this, though, is having partnerships and leadership, like Secretary Snavely and our commissioner is uh, provided us in helping administrate this fund that has helped us be even that much more competitive and bring a product to the table. I'm very, very passionate about the fact that I think we're changing the face of Eastern Kentucky and Northeast Kentucky and all of Appalachia. I think that if you look in five to 10 years at the, at the distressed counties list at the uh, ARC, you're gonna see significant changes because we have a product. We have a product and we know what we have and how to market it. I am grateful to all the partners that we have and I invite those that are hearing things for the first time to take a look at an area that's going to lead the way in economic development over the next decade. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim. You can uh, well see why it's an exciting time to be here in Kentucky and uh, even to be a part of this AML program. Our final presenter will be Daniel Elliott, who serves as the president and CEO of Interblue. Mr. Elliott is a recognized leader in business development strategy in the sustainable energy sector. Mr. Elliott has worked globally identifying and commercializing leading edge technologies and has led corporate merger and acquisition transactions, technology validation, manufacturing plant construction, strategic partnering development, and other key activities associated with business success and growth. <clears throat> Mr. Elliott has worked with leading battery chemistries, photovoltaic and inverter systems for mobile and grid-based systems. In 2008, Mr. Elliott advised President George W. Bush on sustainable energy for transportation and renewable energy for transportation. He has also won the Department of Energy, energy Innovators Award for his work in rapid charging high C rate battery technology commercialization. Mr. Elliott holds a BS in mechanical engineering from California State University, Long Beach, 
and also an environmental sciences degree from Columbia Southern University. Please welcome Daniel Elliott. So first of all, uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm, Tim, um, because economic development really is um, a tough business and you gotta be uh, an enthusiastic player uh, for sure. Um, I've buttoned my coat, but I think I've been eating too many uh, hot browns and mint juleps. Um, either that or the dry cleaner gave me somebody else's suit. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Inner Blue and then more specifically about the AML funds and how that really works uh, with us in terms of what we're doing, but I think in general um, for the attraction of business to the Appalachia region. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. So first of all, uh, my message is probably a little bit different than you heard earlier. Uh, we are certainly not an enemy to coal. We're not an enemy to really any uh, type of energy. I think, uh, you know, however it's produced, uh, we just want to be the guys that are balancing that energy, using it, storing it in different and unique ways. Uh, but what we do see happening around the world is that uh, we are moving as a society, as a, a global society, over to more and more renewables and coming off of finite elements. Uh, when you talk about natural gas, petroleum, uranium, coal, all of these are finite. The sun is going to shine uh, every day in, in every country. Um, you'll have some cloudy days or things like that, and you have to mitigate for those things. You have to deal with it in terms of storage. Um, and as was said earlier, you have to be able to shift the time of day, perhaps, that you're doing it. Um, but the thing is, is that the sun always shines. And it's really not any more about uh, government incentives or about um, how do we you know, clean the air or whether or not it, that that's even an argument. It's really about technology. And I, and I would you know, say, if you look, what, what's changing it is, you know, I have a computer in my pocket, right? And 10 years ago, um, this didn't exist in 10 years. My son, I gave him one of my old iPhones, he's 15 years old, and we were driving in the car. He said to me, Dad, what apps did you have on your phone when you were a kid? <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, I'm not that old, 47 years old, but I explained, no, the phone was plugged into the wall, and we used to drag it down the hallway to talk to our girlfriend. And um, he paused for a moment, and he said, well, that's stupid. Why would, in, why would anybody want a phone plugged into a wall? He'd never seen it. So, you know, we have to think about what's changing. And for the first time ever in the history of the world, every single country has the opportunity to be energy independent from one another. And that is huge. And if you look at, there's projections by 2050 that we're going to double the, the world's energy use. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen sooner or later, but it's going to happen because we have electrification of transportation coming. We're all using computers and iPhones and iPads and smart this and smart that. So all of this requires energy. So it will double. It will triple. I just don't know the time frame. I can pull all kinds of reports that say it's by 2030, 2050, whatever. There's uh, a lot of news out there in the banking world that says there's a six to eight trillion dollar shift in how we buy, spend, and use energy over the next sort of 12 years, between now and 2030. Six to eight trillion dollar shift. We talk about how is that going to happen? Well, think about autonomous vehicles. My daughter, I have a, a young daughter at home, she's three years old, she'll probably never drive a car. Um, because, you know, I, I, I can't even think of the last time I rented a car and I, you know, now I used to use Uber. Well, pretty soon that Uber is going to show up, but there won't be anybody driving in it. You'll just hop in the back seat and it'll autonomously take you where you're going to go. It is happening much faster than we can believe. Um, but there's an issue with these batteries. Uh, it takes batteries. You have to store it somehow. There's an issue. The issue is, is that batteries historically were made for these devices, consumer electronics. So they don't work well where it's cold and they don't work well where it's hot because I don't work where, well where it's cold or hot, so it wasn't really an issue. Um, room temperature is great. 
Problem is, that's not the way our utility system works. It's not the way our military works. It's not the way our infrastructure and transportation works. Um, these systems have to perform where it's cold or where it's hot. In Arizona, in the summertime, they have to work. They have to work reliably, and they have to work for 30, 40, 50 years, not 18 months. So what we did is we optimized the technology that we're going to build here in the Appalachian region, and I'm going to talk up a little bit about that, but just to give you an understanding of what's going on, we've optimized that technology for primarily hot environments um, because you can warm something up a lot easier than you can cool something down. So we've, we optimized it primarily for hot environments. Two-thirds of the world's population lives where it's hot or damn hot. And um, if you look at India, South America, Africa, these are emerging economies, emerging markets. These are places that are going to need energy. They need it today. They're, gonna, they're not, as stated earlier, I totally agree, they're not going to build the power grid the way we did. It's going to be decentralized, not centralized. Um, and they need systems that work in these extremely hot environments. So we optimized around that. You know, if you look at trying to utilize a more consumer-oriented technology in these environments, what you'll find is in a graphite cell versus a titanate cell, and I'm not going to get into all that stuff, but basically, uh, if the further you have to cool it, the more cost you, you're spending on your air conditioning systems and your operating costs and so forth. So we've optimized around the height, hot side. And to tell you how reliable these systems are, this was a system that was deployed with this technology um, that some of our people built. 10 plus years ago, uh, it was deployed in the Northeast. It was actually moved twice, um, and it worked reliably all the way up until um, Hurricane Sandy put it under 30 feet of seawater. And, uh, but up until that point, it worked as predicted reliably, and that was one of the systems that was deployed commercially that got people looking at, wow, this actually can work. This will work. And so where we are today, let me talk a little bit about uh, in eastern Kentucky. Um, as you uh, all likely know, we selected Pikeville after we looked at, I think it was a 12 or 13 states, um, several different areas. We were far down the road to do this actually in South Carolina. And um, we ended up getting a call from uh, Governor Bevan. And long story short, now we're in Pikeville. But what is sort of the keys that got us to Pikeville. Um, it's not without its challenges, let me, take, let me say that, because we're talking about mine spoil. I hear about abandoned ma mine lands, but then all of a sudden after we were out there, I started hearing this term spoil. That doesn't sound good to me. Um, and so I've learned what that is now. There's different depths of the fill and how it was put in and when it was put in, and there's all these different types of things that, uh, that, that certainly are new to me. But um, over the last year, we've been doing a lot of work on understanding how to mitigate for these issues, how the facility has to be sited. Literally, you can put it a little bit this way, and it's $50 million less than if it's a little bit that way. It's really amazing. Um, but the work that uh, is, is going here is highly dependent upon AML funds. It's highly dependent upon the great work that Secretary Snavely's office is doing um, that comes through uh, Congressman Rogers. The AML funding is highly important because private industry doesn't feel, they may have in some ways created the issue, but they don't feel that they want to go and spend the money to correct the issue. So they're looking for, hey, where's some skin in the game from the government side. Um, be that right or wrong, that's how they see it. So when we're talking about a facility that is going to cost several hundred million dollars to construct, private industry says, well, we don't want to fix the land or move the water pipes or um, you know, construct certain things out there uh, to mitigate these sites they would prefer that 
they're ready. Um, or that somebody else uh, bears that, that burden. Um, in some ways I agree, in some ways I disagree, but the point in fact is that the AML funding is providing and, and, and the, the necessary need to attract private industry. And that's, that's critical. So where we are in our timeline, and I wanna talk a little bit about why Pikeville for a moment. Um, so first of all, we're, we're getting ready to, to do a step-up facility here in Lexington. The step-up facility is primarily a training center, R&D center that will be open by June. Um, and then we're gonna be doing some near-term construction uh, for products facility, which is actually heavily uh, uh, paid for with AML funding that will begin the employment base um, out in Eastern Kentucky in Pikeville. And that will allow us to start training the workforce as the larger facility comes online. Uh, and that'll take about 24 months to construct from groundbreak. Would have liked to have been in the ground already, but there's a lot of work that we have to do in terms of engineering and soil testing and all of these types of things. And on our particular site, we can't drill down to bedrock because in some cases the fill is 400 feet deep. And um, so what I'm learning is there's a lot of ways to mitigate and to deal with that, and, and they work. Um, but you have to find people that have done that type of work, which, which is exactly what we have in, in Eastern Kentucky. I, they couldn't build a, probably an earthquake building in California just like the, those guys couldn't build out here on mine spoil. So we had to find the right people to understand uh, those systems. But why Pikeville? Well, Pikeville, first of all, there is availability of workforce. Uh, I'm new to Kentucky. I've been living here eight months, recently bought a home. Uh, the weather's a little different than San Diego, but um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, the, the whole state, really, but Appalachia in particular um, is really a, an amazing uh, resource. It's beautiful, but it has a terrific workforce. So I think Tim said earlier about the pick and the shovel for coal mining. That was my vision of, of a coal miner because I watched the movie October Sky. Um, but what we actually did was we had um, a lot of preparation by uh, One East Kentucky, Chuck, Chuck Sexton's group, and some other folks out there that showed us that the, the workforce in Eastern Kentucky understands highly mechanized systems, they understand DC power, they understand production environments, they understand EHS, it's just you know, all the environmental health safety. They understand these things. They are in STEM fields. And what our message is, is we're not trying to you know, be uh, against coal or anything like that. We're just helping to reinvent a region. When I uh, came out of engineering school, I thought I was going to go to work for McDonnell Douglas because that was a big employer where I grew up in Long Beach, California. And it was sort of right at the end of the, the Cold War. Everything was all about aerospace. We had Lockheed Martin, we had Northrop Grumman, we had McDonnell Douglas, and I thought for sure I'd be working on an airplane. By the time uh, I was ready to do that, Lockheed Martin had closed out there. Northrop Grumman was gone. McDonnell Douglas built, built a few more planes for a few more years and then got bought by Boeing. Everything moved out. Um, and if you go there today, where that huge manufacturing site of DC-10s and C-17s and um, DC-9s and MD-80s and MD-11s and all that, that's now computer centers, data centers, um, apartment buildings, uh, all sorts of different types of commercial properties looks completely different. Um, so they revitalized the area. They reinvented themselves. And that's what is happening right now in Appalachia. And it's not about being against one thing or for another thing. It's technology has moved. Technology has changed. And these people, they were not in the coal business. They were in the energy business. because. I'm from California, a lot of our power over the years was coal. I didn't know it. All I knew was when I flipped the light switch, the lights came on. I wanted energy. I never wanted to buy any coal. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to put these people back to work in the energy business. And that's important because 
this is, if I can, well, I don't know. The Marion Branch site, this is uh, the first building that we're gonna build out there, but what, what's actually happening out there is a little bit more than just we're building a f manufacturing plant for some batteries. Um, let me explain a little bit that I had people calling me from Egypt, from the country of Qatar, from India, from London, all over the world about this plant. They're calling us. And um, there was something recently, you can look in the news, India signed a, a deal um, to deploy $1 trillion worth of renewable energy over the next 10 years. I think it's something like two terawatts. I don't know, it's a huge amount. Um, and we're currently in discussion with a group that wants to use the Pikeville facility as the center of excellence and the, 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 the breeding ground, if you will, to eventually take that to India and scale it up even larger. The electrodes that will, there's, it's, a, it's a particular piece of the battery that will go into that Indian plant will come out of Pikeville. Will come out of Pikeville. Pikeville is going to change itself, reinvent itself to not just supplying energy to the United States, but to supply energy to the world. And that's going to happen because of leadership um, that, that is allowing it to happen. When you talk about AML, when you talk about how those funds are deployed, when you talk about attraction of not just Inner Blue or, or Brady Industries, but what's next? Our supply base, their supply base, and even industries that we haven't thought of yet uh, coming out there. There's the workforces there, uh, the resources are there. Kentucky Power has been a, a tremendous um, asset for us, uh, Matt Satterwhite uh, and, uh, and AEP in general. But without the AML program, we couldn't perform the mitigation work out there that needs to happen. We wouldn't be able to attract the investment that needs to come. International investment coming into this facility, coming into Brady and others. The AML funding and the leadership around how those funds are deployed effectively and efficiently is absolutely critical. And that's exactly what's happened and that's what's happening today as we're seeing tremendous leadership here in the state of Kentucky to revitalize that region. So I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of insight as to what's happening out there, what we're doing, uh, and, and, and know that partially the AML, but the workforce, the AML, it's a whole stack up of things, not one thing that made the difference, but all of that combined brought us to Kentucky, which made Appalachian won over 12 other states in several other regions because it was preparation that had been going on for a number of years. And that's absolutely key. And I'd like to just uh, thank you for, my, for your time. I know we're a little bit over and uh, hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Tim. Thank you, Justin. I say we're going now to a break, uh, but you can, you can tell the presentations, it's, it's a good time for AML. Uh, we've got a, a hardworking group. We've got some of our guys here. But, uh, again, appreciate your, uh, your remarks and your presentations, and we look forward to working with these guys and other ones that may come down the road. Uh, we'll go to a break now. Then uh, what time do you want us back, Secretary? Back at 10.30? All right. Thank you, guys.